Today's guest on Life and a Living is Elisa Cohen, who is a quite an amazing coach in terms of that her focus is on startups, and she's been awarded many, many awards for her work as a startup coach. She's also a lecturer, Harvard and, and Cornell and other places, and she has written uh, her new book, which is coming out very, very shortly. It's from startup to grown up. Grow your leadership to grow your business. And, and I think that she's written a fantastic book. It's a real toolkit for anybody in a startup. But I've been honest, I think it's not just for startup, but she it's broken to three areas. She focuses on the you, them, and the company. And, and I think it's a really good structure. I think it's a really innovative structure that, she, that she's, that she's uh, developed there. So it's, there's a real how-to. There's a huge amount of content in there. There's a huge amount of tools that you can take and adopt for your business. So I really, really recommend that you buy the book. I really recommend that you sit back and listen to the very entertaining and very interesting Alyssa Cohn. Alyssa, thank you so much for joining us today, all the way from New York City, but originally from Boston. But thank you so much for joining us. It's a real pleasure to have you here. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks, John, for having me. Not at all. You are a lady of many, many parts. You're a specialist <laughs> in, in startup coaching, and we'll come on and talk a bit about that. Mm -hmm. You have been named as the top startup coach in the world by Marshall Goldsmith, which is no mean feat. Mm -hmm. You've also been named as the number one global guru of startups in 2021. Mm -hmm. You're a guest lecturer at Harvard, Cornell, and Henley Business School. You're a recovering CPA, according to, your, to yourself. We'll find out whether you've actually fully recovered or it's a work in progress. And you've also been an investor on Broadway, where two of the investments that you made have won Tony Awards. And I'm also told that you are likely to burst into song at any given moment at <laughs> time. So, we'll so apart from all of that, when you, what, what do you do? What do you do to get busy? <laughs> well, funny you should ask. I'm actually also starting my own podcast, which is the <laughs> same name of my book, From Startup to Grown Up. So, um, I my part of the journey of writing my book was that I interviewed a number of founders and I heard their stories and I sort of understood how they fit into the growth story that I'm interested in. And I was so intrigued and excited and inspired by interviewing those founders that I said, I can't, I can't leave this alone. Plus, which I love the title of my book. I'm like, it needs more uses. So poof, I've started the podcast. Brilliant. That is fantastic. I want to come on to the book because it's a, it's a, it's a really interesting book and I, I love the way you structure it. So I want to come back to that. But how did you, how did you find yourself in that niche of being the coach to startups? Was that very intentional from the beginning or did that just evolve? Well, it definitely evolved. So I think my backstory probably informed it quite a bit. I was, um, I am a recovering CPA, as you mentioned, <laughs> one day at a time. And I was at PricewaterhouseCoopers in their so-called fast track to partner program. And so it was like five years to partner, but in two and a half years in, I just thought this is not it. It's this firm here is, uh, by the way, it's a great firm and also just too big for me. I didn't feel like the work of my hands mattered. And so I really had this noise in my head that I wanted to make a difference, to make a difference. Mm -hmm. And I was looking around and thinking, well, what can I do to make a difference? And two things happened. I met a coach and that was totally inspiring, but I thought I'm way too young to be an executive coach. Like I, no one's going to listen to me. So I actually joined the startup world originally way back when I was still in Boston, I was a CFO of one startup, the head of strategy of another startup. And when that kind of went all imploded back in the, the dot bomb or whatever they call it, yeah. I thought, okay, I'm going to become a coach now. So I had the startup thing in my blood. I loved the excitement of being part of a startup. I loved the journey. I loved everything about it. And when I became a coach, I loved that as well. Once I moved to New York, I began to meet a lot of startups and, you know, sort of evolved my way into growing my practice along with the growing ecosystem here in New York of startups. Okay. And when, so when you engage, because I'm just curious about that, I mean, Firstly, you're obviously and clearly very passionate about startups and fascinated yeah. by, uh, by them. But when you're working with somebody, I mean, what, what is the, do, do you kind of say, okay, I'll work with you for a year or I'll work with you for two years or what, what way do you actually engage and become part of their organization? Well, I don't, you, you don't, you don't become part of the organization. Well, you do, but not, not kind of formally, but right. how do you actually engage with the startup? 
Well, it starts, you know, in different kind of ways. So sometimes a founder, often I get referred by other founder CEO clients of mine, and they refer me to their networks and their friends. And then we sort of see what's going on. You know, sometimes I work with co-founders together, and that's just a couple of months or long term. Um, sometimes I work with a founder, uh, and then I work with another uh, executive, and I work with the executive team. So that whole engagement may be at different levels of intensity, six months to multiple years. Right. Okay. It's interesting. So I want to go go to the book. And I said the book is from startup to grown up, and the tagline is "Grow your leadership to grow your business." One of the things I found very interesting just in the very beginning of, of the book was the way that you broke the book. You break the book into three parts, which is managing you, managing them, and managing the company, which in in a sense is almost kind of the reverse of what what many where many people start in terms they start with the business and the proposition. But I thought very cleverly, and I, and I I get why you did. But maybe just talk about what was the rationale for you when you're actually structuring the book that way. Yeah, John, that's very astute. I I really think that that's how people think about it, right? So like the business, or I have problems with my employees. And in fact, that's the way my clients think about it. You know, they come to me originally often, often when they have a problem in the business, it's not getting results that they want, or they're having an interpersonal problem with one of their executives, one of their employees, something like that. That's how they come to me. And usually within a first meeting, we sort of drill down and unpack what's really going on here. So an executive might come to or a CEO or a founder might come to me and say, I'm having an issue with this executive. He's not doing it right. You know, whatever mm-hmm. it is, he's not doing right. And he's not managing his team appropriately. So I'm like, okay, good. Tell me about that. And then it turns out maybe, maybe he's a bully and he's not, he doesn't communicate with anybody, including the CEO. And maybe he hasn't met his results. He hasn't gotten any results. So I'm saying to myself, this is not really a problem with your executive, right? (laughs) This is a problem with you being unwilling or unable to have the difficult robust, nuanced conversation in some cases that you need to have with people who need to make changes fast or your inability to engage with this person to recognize like, this is what I need to have happen. And if it's not going to happen, we're going to have to part ways. So why, you know, anyone with common sense would say, oh, this guy needs to get fired or at least, at least moved, right? Moved off his position. So what is going on with you, CEO, that you don't see that or that you're not able to kind of get into that with yourself? So that's why I always say people start with the business or people start with other executives or employees, but it always comes down to them. And we work mm-hmm. on them first. And then we can apply strategies and tools and techniques. Yeah. I've got a lot of strategies and tools and techniques to help you do what you need to do with the situation. Yeah, because you know the, the whole book is written very much as like a toolkit to a very yeah. large extent. But one of the things I found interesting when you're talking about the, the kind of the managing you, um, and you, you talk quite a bit in, in that part about self-awareness. Yes. And, and just as a, as a perspective, and I don't know whether this is a valid perspective or not, but my perspective is that, you know, entrepreneurs are not always blessed with a lot of self-awareness. <laughs> Yeah, maybe. I mean, if you think about if you think about people like you know Elon Musk and and you know Steve Jobs, people like that, wonderful, wonderful brains and and creativity and and, and daring and and all of that, but you wouldn't put self awareness as terribly high up on the list. Well, it's interesting you say that. I mean, first of all, we know that we don't know personally Elon Musk or Steve Jobs, yeah. Steve Jobs right? So we have to really understand that we are infused with a whole bunch of mythology about how they are. You know, and Elon Musk shows up on Twitter, and so then we sort of decide how he is. So I'm going to actually put him aside. I think a more interesting character is Steve Jobs. If we take as gospel what's been written about Steve Jobs, he did have a lot of self-awareness as he grew. That is the whole point. Mm. My book is about the growth, the personal growth journey you have to go through to grow from being the founder of a company to a thriving business. And, And Steve Jobs, in many ways, is a case study. He was brash. He was difficult cult. He was dismissive. He was even bullying of people. He then got tossed out of his own company and he had an awakening. Everyone who knows Steve Jobs would say he had an awakening. 
awakening and that he grew that self-awareness. And that's my point of view from, that's my point about writing the book. You can grow. You are not mm -hmm. stuck with anything. You can grow your self-awareness. You can grow your toolkit. You can grow your whole identity around being a better leader, no matter where you start. Yeah. You, you say in the book that leadership is an unnatural act. Yeah. but it is the job, right? Can you just yeah. elaborate on that a little bit? Because I thought that was a great piece. Yeah, yeah. Well, the truth is that when you get to be a certain age, you know, as an adult, you're not naturally inclined to giving your friends feedback. You're not naturally inclined to telling adults what to do. You're not naturally, nobody's naturally inclined to praise people and support people to maintain their confidence even when they screw up, right? Nobody's naturally inclined to do that. You have to learn to do that. When someone screws up, you're like, hey man, you screwed up. Or, so first of all, you don't say anything, right? So you're not naturally inclined to lean into conflict, many, many people. And also, if you do say something, what you wanna do is confront the person or like, you know, like point out they screwed up. But actually, sometimes your best move is to encourage that person, support that person because you don't have another option and you need them to operate with confidence in the business. So it's very situational, but all those things are the things that you need to think about inside of your role as founder, as CEO, as leader, so that you're making the right choices at the right time. Mm -hmm. It's not a reactive sport. That's, that's what I mean by natural. It's not just like, oh, I wake up in the morning and I become this. No, yeah. you wake up in the morning, you put on the mantle of leadership, and then you do every day what the job requires of the leader. And to your point, it's one that you just continuously grow in, isn't it? I mean, totally, it's, it's, yeah. You know, it's, never I mean, done. it's it's never done, absolutely. Right. Mm -hmm. the, the, you also talk about the, um, when you're talking about self-awareness, you also talk about tackling demons in yes. the book. Yeah. And, um, and I was just curious from your perspective on the experience that you have, what would be the most common demons that, that entrepreneurs have when st in that startup phase and as they go through that phase? Yeah, um, that's an interesting question. There's one common demon that people don't always see is that founders tend to be very self-critical. They, they really expect a lot from themselves. And how that shows up sometimes often actually is criticism of other people and like never good enough. But the demon inside of them operating is I'm never good enough. I'm very critical. Um, another demon is imposter syndrome. They're going to mm. find me out, <laughs> right? They're going to like, you know, I won't be able to, finally, my luck's going to run out. You know, I tell the story in the book about one of the um, founders I worked with, uh, Jake, who was having trouble landing his series C. And he's like, oh, wow, game over. If I can't get, you know, it's all the pressure. If I can't get this money, we're going to shut down. If this money doesn't come in, we're not going to be able to make it. And I'm going to be one of those founders who failed, right? So you kind of have this downward spiral in terms of like what's going to happen in worst case scenario that gets in your way. And then this experience of like, I can't do it. They're going to find me out. So one tool I showcase in the book is about creating a highlight reel for yourself. There's actual real research on this is that if you steep yourself in your past accomplishments, your highlights, so to speak, that will help you have confidence to act now today in this new thing you have to do, this difficult thing you have to do. Because the brain doesn't actually know the difference between something that that you've imagined and something that's 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 real. Yeah, I think that's true. I mean, I you know, I'm not an expert in neuroscience. I think people we I think that we have a lot of memes about why things work, but mm -hmm. I do know this. There's a lot of research papers written about self-talk and the importance yeah. of self-talk and what you put into your brain. And there's actually a lot of um, research on sports psychology. I have this book right here, Applied Sports Psychology, Personal Growth to Peak Performance. And um, I read a lot of that book. It's a textbook. <laughs> and it's for it's to help world-class athletes. Well, I mean, that there is, as you say, there's an awful lot of research in it and 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 and, and they practice it. Yeah. If you if you go from kind of the the the, the managing you to managing them and yeah. um you know, there's all that. There's the hiring. There's the developing. There's getting people to work together as a team. There's the firing when that is when that is um, when that is needed. Again, how do you work with an entrepreneur to actually help them to evolve and develop those skills? Because yeah. again, they're, they're not, as you say, they're not natural. No, and the problem with entrepreneurship is that the entry level job is leader. 
right? You don't get to kind of grow up inside of a large organization like IBM. And, and so if you are a young founder and not, not every founder is a young 20 something old year old founder, but if you are, you've had maybe one job or two jobs, maybe one manager experience of a small team or, or one individual. So you've got to learn everything because your entry-level job is leadership. So what I do is I help the founder figure out sort of my, my frame is where are we, where are we going and how are you going to get there? And so what that means is you have a team of executives and three of them are working out and two of them are not. Okay. Where do we need to go? Full, solid, high-performing team. Okay. Fantastic. How are we going to get there? And the, again, I'll tell the story in the book about an executive, a, a CEO um, founder who had two problematic executives. She hired these two executives in Silicon Valley. Oh, it's so fancy. And then she became like intimidated by both of them. And she had this whole story in her head about how they uh, were out to get her, like not out to get her, but like um, they were not being supportive. They were right. making her feel paranoid. So uh, we worked together and I helped her see what was in the way for her of directly addressing it with them. And a lot of it, a lot of imposter syndrome, a lot of concern. What if they quit? A lot of, you know, fear. Maybe it's me. Maybe I'm the problem. You know, maybe I should just go with it. She then went and addressed it each with the two executives. One executive was like, oh, I would love to help support you and tutor you in some of the language of Silicon Valley and build this big business together. That was great. And so then they could like rebuild their relationship and make it really productive. And this executive was like amazing. And the other executive turned out to be like her, like her concerns, not a team player talking behind her back, fomenting, you know, sort of like yeah. uh, gossip among the team. And so she had to fire him. So we had to work together to figure out how are you going to address these two specific situations to get where you need to be, which is a high functioning team. Hmm. Just curious when you're, when you're talking about that, and it was just as, as I was listening to you there, I was thinking of when you're, when you're helping these, these, these startups, is it important for them to have uh, an idea or, uh, you know, yeah, an, an understanding of how they're going to exit? Or do you deal with that much? Um, you know, I focus really on the on leadership. Mm. So part of leadership is certainly having a vision. And if you're a founder, start, you know, starting a startup and you're going to lead a startup, I think about your vision kind of in two aspects, right? One is what is the full fruition of this business? What are we trying to create in the world? That's the vision, the mission, those important things. And those are super important. And then there's no question, there has to be at some point a plan for economic viability. Are we going to just be an operate, a going concern operational? Great. If that's what you want. You make different choices if that's what you're going to do, or if you're going to go public, or if you're going to get bought. An example is if you're going to go, if you're going to try to get bought, it's really helpful to build the relationships of possible acquirers well early on, you know, two, three years before the event itself. That's a different calculus when your plan is to go public. So I help founders kind of think about that for themselves, but you know, it's not a rallying cry to their teams to say, we're going to go public or whatever. It's more, you really got to think about the vision and the mission of what the business is going to accomplish in its full fruition. Mm. Can I also ask you, Alyssa, the, the just which I'm interested in, because the, the, this is the whole thing about strategy, right? Mm -hmm. And and there are kind of different schools of thought about you know, the, the the development of strategy. And some people yeah. say, okay, you know, it's a three to five or ten year, or whatever. And others are saying, no, no, it's not. It's 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 kind of being clear in the vision, and then you've got a one a one year evolving strategy. Where do you fall in that camp? Oh, well, I guess every startup I've ever worked with has evolved their strategy, every single yeah. one. I mean, I think every business evolves their strategy over time, right? So you can't pick a strategy. I mean, the world is changing fast. Technology is changing fast. I don't think you can pick a strategy today and think it's going to be the same strategy for 10 years. I think it's important to re I think it's important to let a strategy play out for a little while. I think it's important to keep looking at new data. And if the new data continues to reinforce your strategy, even if it's not working, you might want to give it more time. But also, new data may just make help you decide to rethink your strategy. What I really focus on is for the leader to make sure that she is making good decisions about the big picture of the company, making sure that her managers and leaders are operating inside of the company in a high functioning way and really and, and leading that company to success, however that turns out. Yeah, I mean, I, I certainly would be in your camp in the sense of 
the um that yes be clear about your vision yeah. um but also have a, a very um you know kind of living breathing strategy that evolves as as uh, as you see yeah. in managing the, the the companies um the section you very often the skills that actually t that that are required to get the business started and up yeah are not the same skills that are, can take it to the next level yeah right now in some in some cases people can acquire those skills but there's also you know a school of thought that you know it's actually a different person and a different type of leader that yeah. that takes over is that something that you have found or that you factor into the work that you do yeah, definitely. I mean, in my book, I talk in the first section about self-awareness, as you know. So part of self-awareness is, hey, are you the one who wants to be the CEO? Because that's really going to be a big pain, right? If you like to create product, which is a very common sort of founder, yes. you know, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. tool, right? Or if you love to code and you're starting a company based on this coding, you don't have to be the CEO. Maybe you want to, you know, start it for a little while and then get, you know, get funded and, and grow to a certain state. And then maybe you want to bring in someone else, a more professional CEO, so you can focus on what you want to do. But many founders do want to make that journey. So yes, it's a different skill set. Uh, and that's the whole point about your need as a founder to grow rapidly if you want to do that. It is a different skill set, though. Mm -hmm. A founder needs to be visionary. A CEO needs to be uh, predictable and operational. You know, a founder needs to insist and bang the table and, you know, sometimes burn the team out. That's just honest. And a leader, a CEO needs to understand that she's managing for, you know, a three-year period, a five-year period. So you don't want to like, you know, sort of amp the team up too much on any given days or weeks. Yeah. So there's different, different skills and tools that you need that are very different from a founder versus a CEO. The question is, do you want to make the lead? Yeah, exactly. In your experience, what do you see as being the the kind of the, the big pitfalls for startups? Oh, well, uh, a lot of pitfalls. I mean, one thing is that, first of all, I, I'll just repeat that, you know, as an entrepreneur, your entry level job is leadership, so as leader, right? So that's already hard. Uh, founders and CEOs, startup CEOs, don't always remember that everybody is watching them that they're under surveillance, that when they make suggestions, they are taken as orders. When they say something, it's like they're it's actually, Scott Harrison of, of Charity Water told me, this is the metaphor he uses, um, standing up on a table with a bullhorn shouting at people. So one pitfall is just knowing how you're coming across. That's number one. Number two is hiring all your friends. That's normal. Right. You hire all your friends because those are the people that, you know, and those are the people that you kind of, you know, did all nighters with in college or worked on your first few jobs with and you know them and you respect them and you trust them. And then over time, your friends may not be able to scale. And then you've got to have those unnatural acts of having difficult conversations with your friends, maybe even firing your friends because they're no longer a fit for the company. And the third thing I would talk about is communication style. You know, founders would kind of say and this notion of authenticity. Oh, I'm just me. I don't talk that much. Or, oh, I'm just me. I brainstorm all the time. Not really, because you are the CEO. It matters what you say. It matters what you do. It matters what you don't say. So you've got to learn to have the appropriate communication at the appropriate time. And you've got to learn not to just kind of brainstorm unless you want people to run off and do the thing that you just were kind of musing about. Okay. And for... Most businesses, I mean, if I, if I go back to quote, well, probably misquote Warren Buffett, but it, the the his his what he was saying, and I always think it's a, it's an interesting way of looking at it. He said there, you know, for any business, irrespective of how how big or small, there should be you know five or six things on your dashboard, and if yeah. you manage those five or six things, then you've got a yeah. chance of having a good business. That's probably a complete misquote of his, but the idea was kind of is kind of in there. Yeah. For you, for when you're working with your clients. What are the things that you, you make sure that they have on their dashboard? Yeah. So I have a whole section on metrics in my book and here's the, here's the, the, the TLDR, right? Here's the net. Uh, it really depends on your business, right? So you've got to think about what metrics do I want to track in my industry based on my stage. So mm -hmm. series A, you know, sort of early, early stage is looking for proof of concept which means you might want to be tracking users, engaged users, um, 
you know, pickup of marketing in some ways, that kind of thing. You may not be tracking revenue. Series C and Series D, you better be tracking revenue and you better be also tracking kind of pipeline and understanding how you'll be able to predictably get to recurring, you know, the, the sort of SaaS model is recurring revenue. Um, you may also want to think about, certainly at that point, you're going to think about your customer acquisition cost, whereas, you know, in the Series A, that's not really what you're focused on at that moment. So it don't, totally depends on your industry and your stage, but the key point is to have a dashboard and to be tracking those metrics. Yeah. And cash is probably what going to be one of them. That, yeah, that's well, be there. that's, a, that's so, of course true. So, yeah. So right there. Yeah. So this is fantastic. The book, the, the book that you've written, I, I think, I think it's very clever. I think it's 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 also, as I said, a great toolkit for anybody. And I think it's 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 also not just for the, the startup. I think it's yeah. a it's a great toolkit for business. You know, wh wh whatever stage you're at, because I think there's an awful lot in there. So I. I really do commend you for that and I wish you Thank success you. with it. I know it'll be an enormous success, as will your podcast be. I've, I've absolutely <laughs> no doubt about it. Two questions I ask everyone um, before we wrap up. One yeah. is a book other than your own yeah. uh, that has had an impact upon you. What's the book and what's the impact? Uh, well, I'm going to go with a book by my mentor and friend and, and wonderful uh, role model, Marshall Goldsmith. He wrote a book called his third book, I think it was called Triggers. And Triggers comes out of his daily question model, um, which really is about helping you determine and decide what you want to do, who you want to be in the world, what the behaviors are you need to do to do that, and then asking yourself on a daily basis, are you following those behaviors or not? And I have found that to be very impactful for me as a process. And also Marshall has had a massive positive impact on my life. So yeah, well, I, by Marshall yeah. <laughs> I, I could endorse that because I mean, I, I'm a member of, of uh, Marshall's world and, yeah. and, uh, and, and, and a great advocate of the strategic center coach. So it's, uh, oh, yeah. he's, he's, he's quite some, uh, something else. Secondly, yeah. daily rituals. Yeah. Do you have them or what do they do for you? Yes. I have a daily ritual that I am, uh, you know, all my daily rituals are a little bit like, Oh, you know, wet cement, like loosely held except for <laughs> one. For one, I do fitness every day. So I either run or work out with kettlebells every single day uh, because that helps me get my head together and that helps me get grounded. And I know the day has started once I've done my, my morning fitness ritual. Fantastic. And I know that you've just done it just before we start this interview. Yeah. Because you told yes. me that. So well done. You, you did it for today. And listen, this has been fantastic. I really enjoyed it. It's been yeah. great to have you as a guest. We'd love to come back and, and invite you back again. And, and I wish you every success with the, with the book and with the podcast. Where can people get in touch with you and where can they get the book? Oh, thank you, John, for asking. So everybody can come to our website, alissacone.com, A-L-I-S-A. C O H N.com. I'm Alyssa Cohn on all the socials. Come by and say hi. But uh, in the next, well, by the time you, by the time you release this podcast, you'll be able to come to my website and get five scripts. So part of my book, I include at the end scripts for delicate conversations, which people find very helpful, not just for founders, for everybody. So you can come to my website and you get a few bonus scripts for delicate conversations that are going to help you do your work better and also give you a better life. AlyssaCone.com. <laughs> they will find you there. And that'll all be in the show notes. Alyssa, thank you so much. I wish you every success. I look forward to catching up with you soon. Thank you very much, John.